one. Coming up on today's nightly news. David Cameron threatens veto over EU budget rebate. Belgium boots out unemployed migrants. New tougher rules for motorbikes in the EU. And part five of our Brave New Europe series submitted by Ron LaBelle. And in our letters section, Rex Poulton writes, High Treason. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. David Cameron threatens veto over EU budget rebate. David Cameron has promised to veto any new European Union budget that reduces Britain's annual rebate. The Prime Minister said he would fight incredibly hard to defend a rebate at an EU summit which started in Brussels yesterday. EU leaders are trying to agree a seven-year budget starting in 2014. Now let's talk about the perceived sphere of influence and the actual power for decision-making and veto that David Cameron holds. If you watch part three and four of our Brave New Europe series, you'll already know that EU law is superior and has primacy over British law. Now, there are those that challenge the legality with which previous political leaders have handed over these powers to Brussels, but that's another story. What I want to draw your attention to is a news article also published yesterday in the Daily Telegraph, and I've put the links below. The number of this story is that David Cameron openly admits he can do nothing with regard to removing the voting privileges of prisoners. Now I'm sure you remember the foray about granting prisoners voting rights a few months back. At the time there was no mention that this was mandated by the EU. In fact we were left to assume it was a decision made by our elected MPs in our parliament as an enactment of the will of the people through a democratic government. Now I quote from that article. Prime Minister and his colleagues are facing an absurd situation over prisoner voting, which has been re ruled illegal under European law. So there is a clearly defined example. Just as I said, the European Union has legal supremacy, and to cap it off, the Commission that makes these laws is an appointed body, by invitation only, and can either be voted in or out. Belgium boots out unemployed migrants. The Express Online reports jobless foreigners are being forcibly ejected from Belgium following a public outcry at a massive surge in immigration. Belgian authorities have introduced a law allowing the withdrawal of residency rights from any newcomers remaining unemployed for six months after arriving in the country. Now, we need to be careful here because there is a difference in relative perspective at work. What you and I class as a migrant is someone from outside of our country, but what the government defines as a migrant is someone from outside of the EU. The article skews the perspective by writing, and I quote, many of the migrants being turfed out of Belgium are thought to have moved there from Spain in response to the worsening Spanish recession. So we think, ooh, Belgium's being really tough, why aren't we doing that? But it then goes on to say, some are understood to have originally migrated to Spain from Latin America, which means that the others are from elsewhere outside of the EU. New tougher rules for motorbikes in the EU. MEPs voted to extend Euro 4 emission standards to motorbikes from 2016, mopeds from 2017 and Euro 5 standards to all two or three wheel vehicles from 2020. They also backed the gradual introduction of increasingly advanced onboard diagnostic systems to monitor malfunctions and hence make information on emissions easily available so that the bike can be repaired promptly. Now adopted with 643 votes in favour, 16 against and 18 abstentions. But I know that MAG, the Motorcycle Action Group, have worked tirelessly trying to lobby against this legislation. And as a long-time motorcycle rider who, well, I actually use a motorbike as my daily transport, I also know that the greatest majority of motorcycle riders do not want this kind of legislation. But sadly, it appears that very few in the EU Parliament are listening to what people actually want. Part 5 of our series, Brave New Europe, submitted by Ron LaBelle. 3,000 secret committees. There was, at the time of the publication of the booklet Brave New Europe in 2008, some 3,000 secret European Commission committees. 
The object of these committees are to produce proposals for the directives, discussed in Part 4. No elective MEPs are allowed to sit on these committees, only European Commission officers and invited special experts. Now, who these experts are and what advice they give is a total secret known to only a few in high office. Even the existence of these committees and their members were up to a few years ago kept secret from the public domain. The old saying, what they don't know won't hurt them, comes to mind. So, the EU Parliament's authority. When a proposed directive, usually from the committees just mentioned, is placed before the European Parliament for approval, the MEPs are only permitted to make a timed statement on the proposed directive, usually two minutes or less. The proposal is then passed on a show of hands only. To say that there may be 400 plus members present and the hand count is not an accurate individual one but is a judgement call on what looks like a majority show of hands. This makes the word democratic voting a farce. In one day of sitting there can be a hundred proposed directives voted into the EU system which will eventually be made law in all EU countries. The MEPs usually have a copy of the proposals given to them to read the previous night. To say that there are hundreds of pages of information contained in the documents only ensures that no one can have a clear view on what the directive's proposals are about. Any dissenting voices from the chamber have now been made illegal, meaning that anyone that objects to a proposal can be silenced by the sitting chairman or even removed. So, jobs for life as long as you tow the line. There are thousands of highly paid executive personnel who work for the European Commission. It's estimated that up to 27,000 personnel work for the EU. These executives receive a salary well above that of an identical position out in the business world, coupled with a very high pension package and what seems to some outsiders an unlimited expense account. The EU also has in its payroll many quasi non-governmental organisations that rely heavily on receiving funding from their masters in the EU. These quangos never criticise the actions taken by the EU in case they then will have their funding revoked and in some cases have had to repay all previous funding back to the European Union. There have been many cases in the UK over the years where funds have been stopped due to the fact that the receiving body has failed to fly the EU flag or put up a notice stating that it was being funded by the EU. Now, In actual fact, it's UK taxpayers' money to start with which is redistributed by the EU to make it look like it was through the generosity of the EU that they received that funding. The highly paid executives also have protection from any outside criticism or allegations of fraud or wrongdoing. They cannot be prosecuted for fraud or misdemeanours that occur inside the EU system. They cannot be demoted or dismissed for incompetence. And they cannot be prosecuted for lying or misconduct. In other words, once you're in, you're in for life, come what may. Anyone that wishes to bring the public's attention of any fraud being committed by an executive or branch of the EU cannot use the EU system to bring it out into the open domain because this is barred by EU laws. Once the whistleblower is known, their rights of non-prosecution are gone and they are in all cases sacked and the pension rights scrapped. The criminal executive or employees are usually transferred to another position with the same pay or conditions as before, or remain in the same job as before. So under the EU's eyes, it is not a crime that is wrong, but the fact that it's been exposed. Rex Bolton writes a fascinating letter that brings into question the legal legitimacy of the treaties that have handed governance of Britain to the EU. In it, he writes, in 1972, Edward Heath signed the European Community's Common Market Act, knowingly and willfully deceiving and betraying the British people into European rule. His was an act of outright high treason, and his government thus became an unlawful assembly. Governments cannot bind their successors. Rex goes on to explain how this is then struck down by UK common law. You can read the full detail of Rex's letter on our website, and I've put the links below. Well, that's all from me on the Unit Nightly News. You can get lots more news and stories and information on our website, www.theunit.com. You can get in touch with us there, and we particularly welcome your letters and points of view. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter username is the EUnit. 
and do remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for all of our regular updates. Finally, of course, you can join me and the rest of the team for interactive discussion and debate on Google Plus anytime. Rick Timmis for the Unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon.